Hi, my name, my name is Mike Conley. I'm from Los Angeles. I'm a writer. I'm doing a book called Planetorium, and it's about this general subject. It's intended for the general reader, the layperson, and it could probably best be described as molten salt reactors for dummies. It's going to be an e-book, so it's going to have animation, graphics, links to other uh, websites, and uh, it'll be expandable, updatable, and hopefully it will be used by the community as the one, the first go-to source, the place where new people would start to get a broad, general, comprehensive, yet entertaining and non-technical explanation of the broad subject. Are you thinking right now there's misconceptions or do you think there's no awareness whatsoever? Yeah, I don't, I don't think that the general public is aware of this and I think that the best way for this to become broadly used is to first become broadly known and well thought of and to do that it has to be broadly understood so rather than people taking somebody's word for it, an expert, if they understand the subject, rather than just take somebody's word for it, I think it'll be a stronger, more stable acceptance in society. Because someone who just takes someone's word for it can be easily propagandized or swayed in the opposite direction. But if they actually understand the subject, then they'll have a firm grounding in it and they won't be easily persuaded away from it. So have you heard arguments against molten salt reactors that you think are bogus? Or whether they're true or not, what have you heard against molten salt reactors? Most of the things I've heard against them are people not really understanding that it's a liquid fuel reactor and they keep thinking that it's a solid fuel reactor with fuel by thorium. And the key difference here is we're talking about a liquid fuel reactor is distinct from a solid fuel reactor. And the problem that I think that people have with nuclear is all they know of nuclear energy is what they know of solid fuel reactors and their limitations, their downfalls, and their dangers. And so I think the objections to nuclear power are actually objections to solid fuel reactors. And this is as different from a solid fuel reactor as an electric motor is from an internal combustion engine. It's a completely different system. It is not sort of like, it's completely different. And that is, I think, what needs to get across, to be gotten across and so I think the key thing for people to learn is solid fuel versus liquid fuel. Overview of, I guess, the disadvantages of solid fuel. The problem with solid fuel is that if it starts to overheat, it can't get away from itself and cool off. Or the fuel elements, the fuel rods, can't get away from each other and cool off. A liquid fuel can. A good example is a pot of hot soup. Stick your hand in a pot of hot soup, it's going to burn. Spill it on the floor and walk through it barefoot, it's not going to burn. That's because the fuel, the soup, can get away from itself. By contrast, it's solid fuel would be like sticking your hand in a hot turkey that comes out of the oven. You can wait two minutes later and stick your hand in it again, it's still just as hot. Because the solid, the hot solid pieces can't get away from each other and cool off. And so the, the, the advantage of a liquid fuel, other than the fact that it's already liquid, so hence it can't melt down, it's already melted, is that it can get away from itself and cool off if there's a problem. Solid fuel, it, when it gets hotter, it melts and cuts closer together and the problem compounds. Liquid fuel, as you know, liquids expand when they heat. So if there's an overheating problem, it expands and gets away from itself and cools off. So it's self-regulating. Whether it's solid fuel, the heat is self-reinforcing. So that's, I think, the big difference that if people get the concept of what I use is a pot of soup or a turkey. And it's a real simple way of explaining to even my mother gets it, you know, that um, the difference between solid fuel and liquid fuel, I think it's a great analogy. That, and that's my book is using the analogies like that to get the technical uh, components of this explained in a non-technical common day uh, such, uh, language and examples. And none of this, this isn't rocket science, it's a pot of hot chemicals. It's a stew pot. Why do you think people are so afraid of nuclear power? Because they don't understand it and they've been propagandized against it. And I think even on a, on a deeper level, is something that can harm you that you can't see, can't taste, can't smell, that can get inside your body without you even knowing it. And that concept freaks people out. And what also freaks them out, this is getting a little real deep, but the idea of splitting matter and of creating other particles, you're getting into a lot of alchemical realms 
that I think that starts bumping into a lot of people's religious fears. Uh, it, it starts to get into sort of a scientist as God territory that people, I think, naturally are concerned about. What do you find the most entertaining aspect of the, the molten salt reactor his, history? Oh, about the history, well, one of the things that I found was the one of the anecdotes, a couple of the anecdotes about when they were doing the molten salt reactor experiment in the mid-60s in Oak Ridge. Uh, one story they had, it's, it's a legend, it may not be true, it can be true technically, but it probably actually never occurred, but the story goes that on Friday at 5 o'clock they turn off all the power to the building and just leave for the weekend. And what would happen is the reactor would shut down by itself because cutting the power cut the power to a freeze plug which then melted and the, and the fluid fuel from the reactor drained into holding tanks. And then on Monday morning they come and turn on the power and the pumps would pump the liquid back up into the reactor and they start it up again. And uh, like I said, that, that probably never happened. They probably only had somebody in the building, but it could have happened. I thought that was great. How do you describe radiation in the book? How do you talk about that? Well, we're constantly bathed by radiation all our lives, and our cells are capable of repairing one radiation damage event per second per cell. And so if the amount of radiation isn't that great, it's not a big deal. There's a common misconception and a lie in, this, in the general public that no radiation, there's no safe level of radiation. Well, in theory, you could smoke one cigarette and come down with lung cancer. And so what, it, what you have to take a look at is not the absolute ability or inability of one particle to give you cancer, is you have to look at the statistical chances of that happening. You know, you can get struck by lightning in the next five minutes. Are you concerned? You know, so uh, you have to take a look at the, there's a statistical risk for living on planet Earth. And also, as far as radiation, it has to do with volume and frequency. As an example, you can drink one glass of water and you're fine. You can drink two gallons of water in a week and you're fine. If you drink two gallons of water in one sitting, it will kill you. And so it's the amount and the, uh, the frequency of dosage rather than the absolute dosage. And so there's this concept going around, even one particle can kill you. Well, and you can also get hit by a meteor. It is theoretically possible to get hit by, hit by a meteor in the next five seconds. That is theoretically possible. Are you concerned? So that's the perspective I think you have to look at radiation uh, to uh, have a sensible response to it, or lack thereof. Do you have a? Do you mind trying to articulate that in uh, using the concept of a sunburn? And uh, I'm I'm just wondering if anyone's comfortable doing that. But uh, my notion would be um, if you get a hell of a lot of sun in a fast time. Sun's sunburn's a great example because, as I mentioned before, your skin can re repair one radiation damage. Your cell, each cell, can repair one damage event per second, and so. A sunburn is a great example because if you get a lot of sun and you just keep damaging that skin, you can get sunburn. Uh, you can get cancer, you can get a melanoma, but the thing is, is a lot of the radiation can be uh, uh, protected by dead skin. Dead skin actually protects you a lot from radiation and we have about 30 layers of dead cells on top of our skin, so we already have a natural protection layer that's built into our bodies. You know, I think that people just freak out about radiation without really understanding that much about it. The, is the amount of radiation you absorb over how much time? If you get it all at once, yeah, you'll die. Or yeah, you'll get cancer. Or yeah, you'll get a sunburn or a melanoma. But you get a little bit every day, and that's, that's actually fine. It's actually healthy for the body. It's, there's something called hormesis, which is... Um, radiation damage to a cell and a small amount of it is actually healthy in the same way that exercise is healthy but if you exercise too much you can get sick or injure yourself or kill yourself it's the same with radiation so a little bit of it is okay the same way that a little bit of exertion is good for the body too much exertion is harmful or lethal we're getting a lot of, a lot of feedback from the wind big time so i don't know if there's a way to do uh his back to the wind if we if we want to relocate because um, I, I don't know, I think by... May I suggest? Uh -huh. 
uh, the wind's coming from that way. If we yeah. go across the street and shoot this way, you might be in a no-wind situation over there. Okay, sure. Mike, I know you talked a little bit about, you want to explain the, the banana? Thing. Oh, the banana equivalent does. It's a new terminology in the nuclear community. And what it refers to is the amount of radiation that one receives from eating a banana versus the amount of radiation one receives from living a mile away from a nuclear plant. And apparently, if you eat a banana a week, you're actually receiving more radiation than you would receive by living for down the road from a nuclear plant in a year. So it's actually more dangerous. So what should we do, ban bananas? It's actually more dangerous. So the, the, the fear that people have of radiation is an atavistic, propagandized, completely irrational fear. It is dangerous, it does exist, but you drinking two gallons of water will kill you too. I think the thing that we want to get across is that energy is the lifeblood of civilization. And the advance of civilization has always been predicated on finding a more dense energy source. I mean, our first fuel was food, and that was food for animals and food for humans in the form of slave or manual labor or, or uh, oxen, you know, drawing a plow. And so th then we went to uh, steam, which was wood and coal, and then we went to petroleum. And we're stuck in the petroleum age. Basically, for the last 150 years, we've been burning stuff for energy. And we need to stop burning stuff for energy because burning stuff is putting a bunch of gunk into the environment that is not conducive for the long-term survival of the species and the planet. So what we have to do is we have to use something that makes fire obsolete. And nuclear fuel makes fire obsolete. It has three to five million times the energy per pound of combustible material. So we have to get beyond combustion. And combustion is just a fancy word that means lots of burning. So that's, that's the only thing the word means, combustion. And we have to get beyond burning stuff for energy. And we can either go in two directions. We can go to a dispersed form of energy, which is gathering wind and solar, or we can go to a more concentrated form of energy, which is nuclear. And the disadvantage of wind and solar that will always exist is the amount of labor, energy, and expense of gathering and concentrating and directing that energy. Because energy has to be collected and directed to do work. And nuclear energy has already been collected. And so it needs, it needs to simply be released, captured, and directed to do work. And so I think the only way that we're gonna keep our, our, our global civilization going in the general direction it's going now is to come up with enough energy to power it. And if you think that we have problems now, you don't know what problems are like until we don't have the energy to run the machinery of civilization. So we have a choice of either scaling back our population, which is frightful to consider the options you have to do that, or moving forward and figuring out a, a way to cleanly energize what we have and what we are building. And the only viable option in the time frame that we have is nuclear energy. And we have the ways and means of using it safely, and we need to get rid of the spell, the propaganda that has scared people away from it with some unfortunate accidents that were far less dangerous than what they've been made out to be. And again, what people know of nuclear energy is solid fuel reactors. This is a liquid fuel reactor. It is a completely different ball of wax. That was good. No, that's, that was good. How am I doing? Really good. What do you think the world will look like uh, 50 years from now if, if we stayed on the path we're on right now? Possibly? If we stay on the path we're on right now, I think a combination of Blade Runner and A Boy and His Dog. A Boy and His Dog is a 1975 Harlan Ellison movie. It was post-apocalyptic. I, Mad Max is probably a, a more popular reference. I think a combination of Mad Max and Blade Runner. Honestly, Mad Max and Blade Runner. Sorry, dude. <laughs> we couldn't talk him into it. <laughs> no, what we're going up against, quite frankly, what we're going up against, we're going up against the carbon industry, a petroleum industry that has $27 trillion of proven reserves in the ground. They know they have it. It isn't like we think it's there. They know it's there. And it's valued at $27 trillion. 
and any attempt to introduce an energy system that makes that less valuable, you're bumping up against devaluing $27 trillion. And to be quite frank and brutal about it, you can get people killed for a lot less money than that. And so this is really serious stuff and they will not brook any opposition. And I think the only way to get around that is to literally get around it and inform so many people about what does exist as, an, as a viable alternative that the emperor will no longer have any clothes. You don't fight the emperor, you ridicule the emperor by exposing him for what he is. And you can only do that with education. I've talked to Rod Adams a bit, and oh, you know, Rod, he's, I've, I've exchanged emails with him. He's a great guy. Yeah, and yeah. so um, he talks about education a lot too, and I, I find myself wondering, uh, you know, like PWR has a lot going for it compared to a lot of other energy options, right? P yeah, pressurized water reactors. Yeah, like today's yeah. reactors. Yeah. Um, I used to think they were awful. Now I think that they're actually not that bad. No, but, they're not that bad. There's just. There's two things. One is what we have is so much better. And number two, people have had accumulated a very sour opinion of what we've been using. And gen people are generally open to something new and better rather than, oh, the thing that you've been hating for so long, it's really not that bad. I think it's an easier sales pitch. And also, quite frankly, the molten salt reactor, the light water reactor isn't like a horror show by any stretch of the imagination. But what we have is but molten salt is just so much better. Could you just could you um, paint in a broad picture of like what what society could be like if we if we do this right? If we um, deploy molten salt in reactors? the next fifty, like in the next fifty to one hundred years? Yeah, well, any date range you think. It's just like what can people get out of this? Because I think uh, when people think about energy. They just think of the, what they pay at the pump or how much they pay a month for electricity right. bills. And energy is so much more than that, I guess, is what I'm hoping you can help us articulate. Well, it isn't just the, it isn't just the clean electricity that you get in the house. It would also be the ability to fabricate carbon neutral fuels to use in our existing internal combustion engines because there's still a life cycle. There's an entire internal combustion infrastructure on the planet of uh, fuel delivery, automobile repair, service stations, roads, they're all gauged. The whole p planet's transportation system is gauged toward the consumption of a fossil fuel. With enough electricity, with a molten salt reactor system, you can pull carbon out of the air and fabricate a carbon neutral liquid fuel to replace the stuff that we're pulling out of the ground, which is a, a way of ex, uh, getting the full life cycle out of the infrastructure we've already built up. Because you don't want to just abandon the infrastructure we've already built up. We have trillions of dollars of internal combustion engine machinery around, but we need to at least stop putting more stuff in the air. As I mentioned a moment ago, you can actually take CO2 out of the air, so you can start, you can not only halt the increase of CO2 emissions, you can start to reverse what was there and reverse the coming calamity of global warming. And I'm not even going to get into an argument about whether global warming exists or not. If you have a, a hundred climatologists and 98, to, uh, 98 of them tell you you have a problem and two think you don't have a problem, who are you going to follow? You're not betting the farm, you're betting the planet. So th that's just my only advice on the, the global warming argument. Um, as far as what the future holds, for one thing, the United States military geopolitical interest in the Middle East is predicated on fossil fuel. We're not there because they have broccoli or dates. We're there because they have fossil fuel. With molten salt reactor system, with a thorium paradigm in America, we literally don't have any geopolitical interest in the Middle East other than making it safe for our allies. Uh, which is another consideration, but if they were on fossil fuel, I think that the emphasis put on the geopolitics of Eur the Eurasian landmass, what Zbigniew Zabrzynski called the grand chessboard, the, uh, the Eurasian landmass with the oil, the pipelines and all that, needs to be diminished. And I think that uh, history and geopolitics and politics and uh, the economy has been skewed because of fossil fuel. And energy undercuts the economy because you can't have an economy without an energy without energy to fuel 
the civilization that the economy is basically keeping track of or monetizing. And so the key thing is energy. And if you switch to a clean energy system where a country is truly independent from foreign energy, not just foreign oil, foreign energy, then you can use the oil where you need, really need it for, is high quality uh, plastics, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, lubricants, things like that, um, uh, fuel for airplanes. But as far as ground and sea transportation, you, don't, you shouldn't have to be dependent on fossil fuel for ground and sea transportation. And that's involved all sorts of countries, including the United States, and a lot of external foreign affairs that we really, have, you know, the rest of it, all this democracy stuff is window dressing. What it really comes down to is power, security, and energy. And that whole formula will change. And then to try to paint a picture of how that would change the world, I mean, paint your own picture. That's, that's what I think is the key thing we have to do, is clean up the environment and get off of foreign entanglements based on getting our energy, like why is my oil under your sand? And that's just an insane thought process that leads to nowhere but hell. So, this way I look at it. As, as we know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the damages that are gonna happen are it's kind of, it's already uh, in place and there's nothing we can do. So, I was wondering if you have uh, any ideas on how thorium molten salt reactors might help uh, mitigate um, the, the problems of climate change that we're already experiencing and continue to grow? Well, there, there's, two, there's two things. There's one with the widespread use of clean electrical energy, non-CO2 non energy. You're gonna stop the increase in CO2 emissions as far as the amount that's already in the air, as I mentioned, there are ways of extracting CO2 from the atmosphere. And it can be sequestered or it can be used in a carbon neutral fuel. But if it's sequestered, you'll actually start lowering the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that will, in the long term, reverse what has happened, but that could take hundreds and hundreds of years. We're in for a long period of penance and, tr and tribulation and all that kind of stuff. But we can hopefully mitigate the severity of that by halting the increase of emissions and starting to, to take out of the air what we put into the air. Because basically what we've done is we screwed with the carbon cycle. What, what would normally take like, you know, millions of years to get back out of the ground and into the atmosphere, we're throwing it in there in 150 years. And so we're interjecting this quick change into a system that's a long-term cycle, and then we're doing that to it. And that's going to have a deleterious effect, or a, de a disruptive effect. See? And whereas animals and civilizations used to take hundreds of years to relocate and adapt to new climes, you can't do that in 50 years or even 100, in 100 years, you know? And, and so there's gonna, be, there's gonna be mass disruptions. What is it, 60% of the water in the, uh, in the Indus Valley comes from the Himalayas? And what are they, what are they gonna drink if the, if, the, if, the, um, um, if the glaciers melt in the Himalayas? I mean, these drastic, like, hundreds of millions of people having to migrate on an emergency basis. And the political disruption of that, the economic disruption is astonishing. So paint your own picture. So, so you're proposing molten salt reactor energy being used to do some uh, terraforming or no geoengineering? I guess it's well called. the geoengineering in the sense of removing CO2 that is in the air, and the only thing that's stopping us from doing that, other than political will, is abundant, uh, abundant low-cost carbon-free electricity with which to run the machinery to do that. It's not a complicated process. But to get that much carbon out of the air, you need a lot of gizmos to do it that run on a lot of electricity. And so with an abundance of clean electricity, you can one, not put more in the air, and two, start taking it out of the air. So do you not find renewable energy working to accomplish any of these I don't think the goals? numbers are there. You take a look at the amount of renewable energy that's been put on the market and into use, it's like something like 1% in America and then you have uh, load following problems, it's a cloudy day and the solar panels don't work, and then you need a, a, a gas generator to spin up to like compensate for that electricity, and uh, the amount of uh, gas that it takes to get that, those generators started, um, uh, there goes all your carbon savings right there, and just starting up your generators, it's, it's kind of a, 
I don't see the practicality of it. I'll give a good example. X amount of solar panels will run the United States. Okay, great. Who's going to squeegee all those solar panels? I mean, we're talking, no, you're literally talking about literally hundreds of square miles of panels, not just property to put the panels on, but the actual square miles of panels. You got to keep those things clean. I mean, look at the practicality of it. Where are you going to get an army of squeegee people to clean those things? Seriously. Uh, you know, it's like, let's get practical about this. Let's run the numbers. And I haven't seen any study that has any practical way of generating enough energy and then storing enough of that energy. Okay, so if you have a big solar array in the desert, you want to store the energy, well, pump storage, great. Build a reservoir, well, great. You want all that water in the desert in a drought and you want to relegate it for pump storage and it's going to evaporate it. Now you have to replace it and now you got a farmer downstream that's going to be going to war with you because you're trying to you know, save electricity by using how many millions of gallons of water. And I don't get what the big plan is. I don't see, I don't see the practicality of that. Whereas a molten salt reactor can literally be located anywhere on planet Earth, including Death Valley without water cooling. And why is it possible to do this without water? Why is it possible? It's because the temperature difference. Cool and hot are relative terms. It has to do with the difference in temperature. So if you have a reactor that's running at 750 degrees, Death Valley seems like an Arctic winter night to that reactor. Whereas you have a reactor that's running at 300 degrees, Death Valley at 130 degrees, it's kind of warm, it's kind of cool, but it isn't that much difference. And so cool and hot are, are, are relative terms. And so with a molten salt reactor that runs so darn hot, you can literally place it in the hottest desert on planet Earth and its environment will seem downright frigid to it. So you don't need water cooling as a consequence. Think, uh... So you can add it out on my dire like apocalyptic stuff, right? <laughs> I, I like that though, it gets people thinking. You know? Well, yeah, that's what people are thinking and they don't really want to talk about it, but you know, yeah. this is not gonna last unless you have the energy to run it. It's really that simple. Um, what, what do you think of uh, environmentalists who are staunchly anti-nuclear? They're, they're misinformed. They're misinformed. They've been propagandized um, and they painted themselves into a corner and there's a difference between being correct and being right. And people would rather die than admit that they're wrong. Some people. And so they painted themselves into like a saving face corner. And you have to help them find a way to save face. And the way to do it is actually not that difficult if they'll listen. What is is this, is that you hate nuclear waste, so do I. These reactors can eat nuclear waste. Wind and solar, if you want to try to run the planet with it, more power to you, but wind and solar cannot eradicate one single atom of nuclear waste. None of it. So if you really hate nuclear waste, then you would want these reactors. And even if you only allow them to remediate nuclear waste, then we'll take that deal. And then in the time that we're remediating the waste, we'll show you how effective the reactor is. So basically, that's the trump card. That's nothing that they can argue against, is if you really hate nuclear waste, you want these reactors because you don't have an alternative solution other than burying it for 100,000 years. And even if you were to shut down every single reactor on the entire planet and run the whole planet on wind and solar, let's go to that hippie dream and do that. You still have 70,000 tons of nuclear waste in America, and your only solution is burying it. And we have a solution of actually making it cease to exist and making carbon-free energy with it in the process. Wouldn't that be a slightly better deal than burying it? May you, would you please consider that as an option? And that basically takes the air out of any anti-nuclear environmentalist balloon. And what we're dealing with here, you take a look at this, is you have 70 tons, 70,000 tons of American nuclear waste, all right? You're going to need, like, let's say, a ton to run an experiment molten salt reactor, a ton of fissile fuel, all right? If the reactor works, we've opened the door to remediating all nuclear waste. If the reactor doesn't work, we've added one ton to a 70,000 ton pile. So the number on that is 
zero 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 one four two percent. That's one seventy thousand. So I'm asking somebody to take a zero point zero 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 one four two percent chance on one more ton of nuclear waste to see if we can remediate all of it on the whole planet forever. That's the gamble I'm asking an anti-nuclear greenie to take. Pardon me, that's supposed to be an offensive phrase, greenie, an environmentalist. See, what they don't get is we hate nuclear waste too, but what we really hate is we hate wasting it. Because nuclear waste is wasted fuel. And when they get that nuclear waste is wasted fuel, and when they confront the fact that their prescription for a clean planet has no remedy for nuclear waste that already exists, then they basically painted themselves into a political and philosophical corner, and we can get them out of that corner as long as they go, okay, well, we'll get, we'll, we'll, let's test this stupid thing and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, then we've just made fools out of ourselves in front of the whole planet. And if it does work, we've handled their, the thing that they love to hate the most. So everybody wins. What would you say the biggest uh, shortcoming of today's reactors is? The biggest shortcoming of today's reactors is their solid fuel reactors. Any solid fuel, there's two problems with solid fuel. Any, any, solid, any, fuel, any nuclear fuel that fissions creates poisons that can poison the fuel itself unless the poisons can come out of the fuel. They're called fission products. They're the product of fission. You split an atom, you got smaller atoms. Some of those things kill fission. That's one problem. The biggest culprit is a gas which bubbles out of liquid fuel. So that right there, you just solved that problem. The other problem with solid fuel is when it heats up and needs to cool off, you have to cool it off in an external method of cooling because you can't get it away from itself one fuel rod away from another fuel rod so they can cool down. Liquid fuel, my, hot, my pot of hot soup analogy, liquid fuel can spread out and cool off. Solid fuel can't. So if you can't, if you can't draw the heat away from solid fuel, you got a giant problem. With liquid fuel, worst case, absolute worst case catastrophic apocalyptic scenario with liquid fuel, the reactor breaks and it spills. Visualize a load of spilled concrete. It cools at room temperature. That's as far as the spill goes. And so in a catastrophic reactor emergency with a liquid fuel reactor, your, your mess is measured in square meters, not square kilometers. And so you have a screwed up reactor building, not a screwed up county or prefecture. What, what would happen if they had molten salt reactors at Fukushima Daiichi? The worst that would have happened was three or four screwed up reactor buildings. Because the, the worst, absolute worst case apocalyptic nightmare scenario at Fukushima would have been that the reactors would have broke, the stuff would have spilled out, and it would have cooled and solidified in moments into, visualize uh, lava cooling at the beach in Hawaii. It comes out like molten hot, Molten lava is liquefied rock, hot rock, molten salt, melted, melted chocolate, melted candle wax, and room temperature, it solidifies. So visualize a big vat of thin green lava that looks like, actually looks like dish soap, that, but it's 750 degrees Celsius. That bursts, it spreads out, cools, turns into a solid mess, you cordon off the building, and the whole county cleans up and gets back to normal. You have no abandoned villages, no abandoned farmland, no abandoned schools, no sushi that you can't eat, no stuff drifting to California. You have four really screwed up buildings. And I always had a question about Fukushima. Is the country that coined the word tsunami built a reactor at the beach? I don't get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you need, with today's reactors, you need the water to cool the reactor. There's no reason they could have pumped water inland a further distance and just pumped it in and pu pumped it in cold, pumped it out warm. Right? Well, you think they could have done that or also they could have built on the leeward side of the island. Um, the, on the west coast of Japan, there's a lot of reactors, but you don't have the tsunami activity there because of the, there's that tectonic plate east of Japan 
and that's the one that shifted that gave the tsunami. Well, you don't have that tsunami stuff going on on the west side of Japan, west coast of Japan. So what about building the reactors on the west coast if you need a water-cooled reactor and, and transmitting the electricity over the hill? So I just thought it was, I apologize for embarrassing the Japanese, but I thought it was kind of hubristic of them to build a water-cooled reactor on the beach in a country that coined the word tsunami and then put the, the pools to cool the, the fuel rods right above the reactor. It just seemed like not the best design. But if there were molten salt reactors there, they would have been in underground silos. And as I say in my book that a tsunami or a tornado or a hurricane would have rolled over them like a truck over a manhole cover. So the worst case scenario is the, the silo would have flooded, the reactor would have shut down, or even if the reactor broke and the stuff spilled out, you would have had a very messed up silo. But it wouldn't have been 30 kilometers downwind, it would have been maybe 20 or 30 meters away from the, from the entrance point of the silo. So you cordon that off and get, life goes on as usual. And when that cools off... Okay. It's just gonna keep getting louder and louder, eh? There's no... There, yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's going to, the fire is over there somewhere, it's going to pull up right here in front of us. Yeah, we're going to stay here. Yeah. yeah. And so that's the, that's the thing about, about Fukushima was if you had molten salt reactors there, if they broke from the tsunami, I would have put them in silos and nothing would have happened. If they were ground level and they broke or washed out the sea, they're not going to get very far. Visualize a load of concrete spilling from a concrete truck or visualize uh, a little miniature lava flow in Hawaii that hits the ocean. And that steam you see coming off a lava flow is the seawater turning to steam. It isn't the lava turning to steam. It's the lava boiling the water that touches it. So imagine, just visualize a lump of cooled solid lava. That would have been about the extent of the damage and the extent of the spread. So when you get steam, if uh, you have water impacting uh, the molten, the fluoride salts, molten fluoride, molten salts, mm -hmm. um, is that steam then radioactive? From what I remember talking to my chemist, and this is one of the things I have to clear up for the book, but you're going to get a little bit of a, a radioactive release when water hits the molten salt, but the molten salt cools almost like that. So it's not going to be hours and hours and hours of steam right and miles and miles downwind yeah you might get a burst of it but that's going to be then dispersed it's like the tritium at yankee uh yeah there was some tritium that got into the groundwater but as i mentioned in uh, pandora's promise uh you know you could have drank all the all the water out of that plant for an entire day it would have been less radioactivity than eating one banana and so you have to look at like radioactivity again isn't an absolute particle it isn't like you know these are like poison pills, any one of which you swallow will kill you. You know, it's, it's a, what's called the stochastic effect. It's, it's, it's statistically, it, you, have, you have to take a look at the statistics, the, the, the chance of, of harm. And yeah, you're gonna, get, you're gonna get some steam boiling off that's probably gonna carry some stuff, but it's not gonna be hours and hours and days and days. It's a momentary burst release. And it's, it's not like, you know, okay, that'll kill 20,000 people, no. <laughs> you know, it, it, but, and with a solidified spill, you're gonna have to do something stupid like lick it to get it in your body. Uh, you know, so I, those are some of the things, the book isn't done, I have to dial in those specific questions. Yeah. But. No, it's good though. I mean, if you happen to answer them correctly, then we can use that footage. Well, there it. you go, exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, no, you don't wanna be immediately downwind of the steam the moment the water hits the, 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 the salt, you know. Probably not, not a good idea, but uh, you know it isn't like oh my god for the next month as the waves hit this thing we're in a lot of trouble. Right, yeah. it's it's basically trapped in by the solid. It's, it's trapped by even the, if the middle is still molten, the outer shell is coating the, uh, it. The outer shell is 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 firm, and also the minerals in freshwater and seawater form a protective crust on it, similar to um, anodized aluminum, like old lawn chairs, like the crust on aluminum and uh, that all that further locks it in. Kim Johnson was explaining that to me. So that further locks it in. So basically what you have, and also another thing to understand is, is the, the radioactive material in molten salt is a 2% solution. 
So 98 out of 100 particles are benign. And, and if you have a spill, you know, what's the surface area versus the total volume? You start doing the calculations, and there's maybe one one thousandth of the stuff that was in that reactor is on the surface that's capable of harming you. And if it solidifies and chemically locks, then it might be just those one or two few seconds when water first hits it that might carry some of the stuff away. But it's like, it's, just like, it's, like, it's a burst. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, th these things don't run on granola. It's nasty stuff. <laughs> you don't want to get near this stuff but it's not going to spread. The thing is, is it's not going to spread. It's so like I said, if there's a spill, it's going to be measured in square meters, not square kilometers. That's the difference. No, they don't run on tofu and granola. U-233 is ultra nasty stuff. You know, but it's not going to wind up in California if something happens in Japan. Or it's not going to wind up in Tokyo if something happens in Fukushima. And that's the important thing, is, is when you have a solid fuel reactor, the scare is, is it going to screw up like San Onofre, I live in Los Angeles. San Onofre is 100 miles south on the ocean. Is it going to screw up Los Angeles? No, it might screw up a couple hundred acres in San Onofre. Yeah, but you're not going to have to evacuate San Diego. Any energy source has a liability. Any energy source has some sort of downside. There's toxic materials used to fabricate solar panels. Hell, the installation of solar panels, more people have died falling off of roofs and installing solar panels than have ever died from nuclear power in the United States of America. No one has ever died from commercial nuclear power in the United States of America, and three have died from military nuclear power in the United States of America. But there's a couple dozen people every year that fall off roofs installing solar panels. Actually, I have to update the video because one guy died of commercial nuclear power in the United States. Really? In 2013. I forget what it was. It was just like, um, you know, it was a physical accident. It had nothing to do with radiation or anything like that. <laughs> okay. But what Thank was you. funny when I was tallying up stats for uh, death, nuclear deaths and various, in, in, in various energy source deaths, mm -hmm. uh, Japan has a small number of almost regular nuclear deaths. like you know, on the average of one a year, and it's just mining or industrial accidents. It's, occasionally it is radiation, but it's like, there is something that, Fukushima isn't the only thing that's different between what's been going on in North America versus Japan, nuclear power wise. It's like they actually had a, a small steady stream of accidents in Japan, so they must have some sort of, they're, they're approaching safety different somehow in hmm. Japan, and I don't know what it is. I, well, uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, I have to drill down into the, the statistics, but the general statistics that I'm aware of is that the deaths per terawatt hour, nuclear is, is I think hydroelectric is the only, the only safe, but you can't run the planet on hydroelectric. There's not enough waterfalls and rivers. So even though hydroelectric is safer than nuclear power, it ain't gonna happen. So if you take a look at powering the planet, as far as something that is capable of powering the planet, Nuclear is by far less lethal than coal. coal. Well, George Monbiot, the great columnist that works for The Guardian UK, one thing he said is that nuclear, coal kills more people when it goes right than nuclear does when it goes wrong. You know, and, that, and that's, that's one thing to keep in mind is, is like, nuclear is sort of like the people's attitude toward flying. They're all freaked out about being in a, in a plane accident. But planes are statistically way safer than driving, you know? And, and, but there's that, that fear, and a lot of it has to do with what they discovered psychologically, is people are more afraid of flying because they're not in the cockpit. They're not driving the car, you know? And you're not running the nuclear power plant. But you know what it's like to put coal on a fire or a log on a fire. Or you know what it's like to use gas in your home. So you're more capable of being in a causative position with those forms of energy. And when you're not able to be in a causative position, you're more likely to feel you're uh, in, a, in, a, in a position of being at bad effect of something. And so you're more leery of it because you don't know how to control it because you never had your hands on the, on the throttle. You know? So that's part, of, that's part of the problem with nuclear power is we don't have Mr. Fusion. You remember in, in uh, Back to the Future, Mr. Yeah. Fusion? If we had Mr. Fusion, people would be more relaxed about it. They could put the banana in the coffee thing. You can get Mr. Fusion or not, you know? And so part of it is just purely like psychological. I mean, we're not that far removed from cavemen. 
We're still campfire creatures. We need to be face to face to talk to resolve delicate issues. That's why there's meetings, you know? And all this high technology puts you at a distance from your power source and you're more leery of it and you're more easily propagandized.